Well, good afternoon, everyone. I'd like to welcome our representatives from the Embassy of Armenia uh, to the U.S., uh, Reverend Father, uh, distinguished guest, Ambassador Evans, and uh, all my colleagues. And welcome to this auspicious 24th uh, Therapian All Bardenance Day Lecture. This is, I want to extend a very, very warm welcome to you to the Library of Congress. And uh, just a little background about this lecture series that began by a bequest of Mrs. Dedadian in 1991. And we have the founding uh, organizer of this Vardenance Day lecture with Dr. Uh, Levan Adoyan. He's here in the back. <laughs> And he carried this lecture through uh, the years to the 22nd one um, before he retired. And we're so grateful. Many of these are videotaped. And today, we're videotaping this as well. So you can query that on Google and find those former ones. But this is a remarkable series that has continued on and, in fact, is one of the longest running lecture series here at the Library of Congress. And um, I hope that I'm Joan Weeks. I'm head of the Near East section. And uh, we're the sponsoring uh, event or organizer of this today. And this section uh, has fostered this lecture series throughout the years. And the purpose is to highlight all aspects of Armenian life and culture and the role of the Library of Congress collections, uh, particularly the Armenian collections, to study all about the Armenian heritage and history. And so with these lectures, we hope to highlight these collections and inspire people to come in and use them, to use, tell their friends, tell everyone about them, and uh, really foster this study of Armenian culture here at the Library of Congress. So without further ado, I'd like to call on my colleague, Dr. Kachik Moradian, our Armenian Area Specialist, Librarian, who will introduce today's program and our speaker. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, Joan, for the introduction and uh, for your support over uh, the past weeks and months as we put together this program. Uh, welcome, everybody, representatives of the Embassy of Armenia to the U.S. Uh, uh, I believe uh, Father Hofsep is not here yet, uh, but I welcome him uh, uh, still. Uh, Ambassador Evans, uh, distinguished guests, colleagues, I'm happy to see many colleagues here, many faces, uh, members of our community. Uh, welcome to the Vartanas Day Armenian Lecture, the 24th, as, as Joan mentioned, uh, featuring Professor Sebu Haslanyan. Uh, this has been a uh, busy, uh, and, and that's Father Hofsep Karapetian, who has already been welcomed. <laughs> uh, so this has been a busy year for the Armenian Studies at the Library of Congress. Uh, the African and Middle Eastern Division has hosted scholars at the library to conduct research on our Armenian manuscripts and deliver talks on the subject. Uh, we have assisted tens of historians, filmmakers, legal experts, and graduate students conducting research in the field of Armenian Studies broadly defined. Exactly a year ago, the library received one of the largest gift collections of books in decades, some 2,000 Armenian language books selected from the late writer Antonik Poladian's library. We also received a significant gift from uh, community member John Garigian's library, uh, as well as dozens of rare books, hundreds of newly published monographs donated by members from across the U.S. and beyond. The division has also acquired late Professor Dina Garsoyan's research notes as a gift to Ahmed from her estate in early 2023. Garsoyan, a leading historian of Armenian and Byzantine history, is the first female historian to get tenure at Columbia University in 1969 and the first holder of the Avedisian chair at Columbia. Only this year, we have hosted 24 briefings and displays for parliamentary delegations, government officials, Armenian American professional organizations, community organizations, specialists, university students, and middle schoolers. Seven 
seven volunteers and interns, mostly university students, have helped us with, that, with the work of growing and making accessible our Armenian collections. We thank them all. And we have released a series of recordings, including with scholars Peter Balakian, Whitney Kite, who is here in the audience, and Ani Shahinian most recently. But this is our first post-pandemic Vartanans Day in-person Armenian lecture. Uh, and uh, as, as, as Joan mentioned, this, is, this was created uh, by a bequest, after a bequest by uh, Mrs. Marjorie Dadian in 1991. The first lecture took place in 1994, and, uh, and, and today we are holding the 24th Vartan uh, Armin lecture featuring Professor Sebo Haslanian. Uh, his latest book, Early Modernity and Mobility, explores the disparate yet connected histories of Armenian printing establishments in early modern Europe and Asia. From 1512, when the first Armenian printed codex appeared in Venice, to the end of the early modern period in 1800, Armenian presses operated in, in 19 locations across the Armenian diaspora. Linking far-flung locations in Amsterdam, Livorno, Marseille, St. Petersburg, and Astrakhan to New Julfa, Madras, and Calcutta. Armenian Press has published a thousand editions with more than half a million printed volumes in Armenian script. In examining the Armenian print tradition, Professor Aslanian tells a larger story about the making of the diaspora itself. Sebo Aslanian is professor and Richard Hovannesen endowed chair in modern Armenian history at the University of California, Los Angeles. He's the author of the award-winning uh, uh, from the Indian Ocean to the Mediterranean, uh, the global trade networks of Armenian merchants from New Julfa. Aslanian has published widely on early modern world and Armenian history and is the author of the book he's going to be discussing today, Early Modernity and Mobility, Port Cities and Printers Across the Armenian Diaspora, 1512-1800. If I were to attempt to uh, summarize Professor Aslanian's groundbreaking work in a sentence, I would say that by placing Armenian history within global history, he has unshackled the former and enriched the latter. Please join me in welcoming Professor Aslanian. for those wonderful words. Uh, you summed up my lecture in ways that probably uh, uh, I, w I won't be able to do in such a short, uh, uh, concise manner. And I'd like to thank everyone for being here. I'd like to thank especially the Library of Congress, the Vartanans uh, Lecture Series, the founders, particularly my old friend Levon Abdoyan, who started all this many years ago, and he's still here. I want to thank Khajik especially. I'd like to thank uh, Ms. Beard in the back and a number of other people who made it possible for me to be here today. And of course, last but certainly not least, I'm grateful to all of you for being here as well. It's a great honor and privilege for me to stand before you today. I've always wanted to give a talk at the Library of Congress, I'll be honest. So it's, it's a very nice invitation. I'm thankful for that. So what I'm going to do is Khajik, uh quickly summarized, and I also wanted to uh, uh, thank all the dignitaries in this room, ambassadors, former and present, uh, um, uh, the, the uh, priests, uh, fellow scholars, friends, well-wishers, everyone. So thank you all for being here. So what I want to do today is I wanted to give you a small overview of my book, and I'm going to begin by doing that, uh, I'm going to begin that by uh, reading a, a short text from the conclusion of my book, and after which I will then switch to auto, autopilot mode and uh, proceed with the rest of my lecture. So, in his L'Origine de l'Imprimerie de Paris, published in Paris in 1694, André Chevillier, a librarian at the Sorbonne, recalls how an Orientalist colleague told him that, quote, an Armenian had shown him in Paris a book he had brought from Persia that he claimed que prétendois, those of his nation had printed in their own language." Unquote. The author's reluctance to believe that Armenians in 17th century Iran 
could have published a book in their own language is a telltale reflection of a popular misperception in early modern Europe regarding the craft of printing. Scholars of print culture from Chevillier in the 17th century down to Lucien Febvre and Henri Jean Martin in the 20th, and more recently, Elizabeth Eisenstein and Al Green have perpetuated this misconception to some extent uh, by at one point or another claiming or implying that the printing revolution initiated by Johann Gutenberg in, for, in the 1450s, uh, more or less, was uh, something that unfolded on a European or settler European stage. In other words, that it's a European uh, endeavor. Chevillier once again reinforces the exclusively European nature of the printing revolution. And I quote here from uh, the same book that I mentioned. And he says, it is true that the printing press has left the bounds of Europe and has made itself visible uh, in some cities of Asia and America. However, the people who have hosted this, who have hosted it, have not been other than European uh, or then Christian Europeans who live in those parts of the world and who have carried the tools of printing through which they have placed in the hands of the idolaters books of the Christian religion in, those, in the languages of those lands, and unquote. In the passage, uh, in the same passage where Chevillier expresses doubts about the possibility that an Armenian book could have indeed been printed in Iran at such an early date, he notes how the Carmelite missionaries had tried to import a printing press into Isfahan in the early years of the 17th century, but it failed to publish any books there due to the dry climate of the country. That indeed three separate Armenian-operated presses flourished in the Isfahani suburb of New Julfa from 1636 to 1694, followed during the next century by several Armenian-operated presses in the Indian Ocean world, as well as in Ejmiadzin in present-day Armenia, would have probably struck our Frenchmen as quite preposterous. So my book, Early Modernity and Mobility, Port Cities and Printers Across the Armenian Diaspora, 1512 to 1800, provides a missing counterpoint to the largely Eurocentric retellings of book history shaped by unexamined assumptions passed down from early writers like Chevillier to 20th century giants in the field of Histoire du Livre, the history of the book. Now, relying on the methodological insights of the Anal School, but globalizing its European or national unit of analysis, my book examines the rise of Armenian printing centers beginning in 1512 in Venice and ending in Astrakhan, Madras, and Calcutta in the 1794 to 1796 period, mostly in, in the mostly port city seascapes of the early modern Armenian diaspora. In all, Armenian printing establishments operated across 19 or 21 separate locations. The, the number is probably 21. Uh, I was mistaken in my book, but in any case, two is not going to make a difference in terms of my larger argument in the book. So there are 21 separate locations across the, uh, during the Gutenberg era of printing, the overwhelming majority of which were in port city locations where Armenian long distance merchants specializing in luxury commodities that I call in my book Port Armenians, and it'll become clear to you why I refer to them with the geographic uh, designation of Port Armenians in a second. So, in a, uh, so essentially, uh, there were a uh, majority of the printing centers were in port city locations where Armenian long distance merchants known as Port Armenians and specializing commodities uh, such as luxury uh, goods and so on had set up affluent an af but have, had set up tiny but an affluent uh, diaspora, uh, dia diasporic notes. So uh, I refer to these Armenians as Port Armenians as a calque on Port Jews, uh, mostly because the term is, is used in the scholarship on Sephardic Jews, and I think it actually makes more sense to apply the term Port Armenian uh, to, to use the port designation for Armenians because this refers to a combination of Western Armenians and Eastern Armenians living in port cities. So for the sake of a shorthand term for them, I refer to them both Eastern and Western Armenians in diasporic settings as port Armenians. So yet the story of the print 
Yet the story of, uh, of Armenian print culture that I tell in this book does not focus solely on printing establishments. My aim is not to write yet another linear narrative of the saga of Armenian printing press, of the saga of the Armenian printing press, concentrating on the history of printing establishments and their operators as ends in themselves. Rather, I have sought to use an histoire du livre exploration of Armenian print culture and the production of the printed Armenian codex to tell a much larger story, as Khadjik alluded to earlier. And that is that I have, I have utilized print culture as a lens through which to explore the making of the early modern Armenian diaspora following the forced mobility and deportations that drove Armenians from their ancestral lands across the oceans, seas, and port cities of the burgeoning economy of what Chris Bailey once described as archaic globalization. This is a globalization before the 19th century. Full-blown globalization sets in. So the story of the Armenian printing revolution told in my book was no doubt, I insist, shaped by the port city structure of the early modern Armenian diaspora that came to be, that came to be fashioned and came to be fashioned by its trans-regional networks of circulation and mobility. Both manuscripts and books circumnavigated this diaspora, as did merchants, priests, and sometimes printers or their printing instruments. My account of book history, uh, my account of book history was in part inspired by reflection on reflections on books by the Trinidadian novelist and writer V. S. Naipaul, and I'll spare you the part about how I don't usually agree with any of his subject positions when it comes to the world at large, but nonetheless, given that he's such a beautiful writer in the English language, I follow his inspiration here in terms of looking at books, uh, in terms of what he called uh, the mundane side of things, and how, as Naipaul described, and I quote here from this famous essay of his in the New York Review of Books in the 1980s or 90s, he says, writing is a private act, but the published book when it starts to live, speaks of the cooperation of a particular kind of society. Naipaul framed the act of book production in a wonderfully evocative way, and I quote here from this same essay that I've alluded to, and I quote, but books are not created just in the mind. Books are physical objects. To write them, you need a certain kind of sensibility. You need a language and a certain gift of language, and you need to possess a particular literary form. To get your name on the spine of a created physical object, you need a vast apparatus outside of yourself. You need publishers, editors, designers, printers, booksellers, critics, newspapers, and magazines, and of course, you need buyers and readers." Unquote. So what do I like about this uh, reflection of Naples? What I like about it is its hard-nosed emphasis on the materiality of the book itself, on the simple fact that to appear before you, to materialize before you, books, uh, books need to have a vast apparatus of printers, publishers, binders, book, book distributors, distrib and so forth. In early modernity and mobility, I have tried to apply this kind of Napoleon sensibility in my retelling of the story of the Armenian printed codex. So, with that said, I'm going to very quickly now switch to the autopilot mode and give you a brief idea of the contours of this, uh, this book of mine, the second book that I published. I'm holding in my hands in case uh, you want to be, you're tempted to go on Amazon.com and after hearing about the, the shrimp dumpling appetizer view of this book, if, you're, if, you're, if, you're, if you have the stomach for it, I hope you will you will serve yourself to a full course meal on Amazon. So please keep that in mind as part of the lecture. So let me begin by saying a few things very quickly about the book itself as a whole. The book took me 33 archives to write, approximately 10 years of hard labor while I was teaching at US, UCLA as the, as the original Venetian chair of modern Armenian history. So teaching a full load plus writing this book, 10 years, uh, it's not a very short amount of time as you can imagine and I was working 10, 12 hours a day for most of this period. So I'll say a couple of things about uh, the methodology that inspired this book. 
I'm going to go back to the Anal School of Historiography, knowing full well that most of you here have probably not heard of the Anal, but I will tell you in any case, uh, I'll give you my shrimp dumpling appetizer version of that school as well. And basically, it's a school that came about in Europe, in France, to be more precise, following the 1929 publication of a journal called Anal, and that had a specific methodology for historians that revolutionized the way historians have written the past over the past 100 years. And so what I've taken from the Anal School is what, I, what one of their representatives, Roger Chartier, famously called Frenchness in the history of the book. So my aim, as I said earlier, is not to write yet another narrative of this printer went to this place, published this book, and so on, and then moved to another location. That has been done multiple times before me and much better than I'm able to do. Uh, my book could not have been written without these earlier uh, old-fashioned kind of straightforward histories of printing. My endeavor, my mission is not to participate in the, in the field known as the history of printing. The history of printing is long considered to have been uh, outdated in European circles. I'm more interested in the history of the book, l'histoire du livre, which is to say how, a book, how books were published, how they were printed as commodities that were traded, that had a price value on them, that had to be transported from the printer to the ultimate end of the chain of consumption, which is to say the reader. And I'm more interested in questions like why were some books published at some points and not in other, at other points? And what was in the contents of the books? And how did the book itself as a printed media, medium transform, utterly transform the mind, the men mentality, mentalité of the reader upon contact with it? These are the questions that the Anal School answered uh, in various works, especially in this work that you can see on the screen here. It's called L'Apparition du Livre, the coming of the book as it's translated in, in, into English in 1993 by New Left Review of Books, and a, a landmark publication in the field. This was published in 1958 by Lucien Febvre and Henri-Jean Martin, still the, the leading work in the field in terms of how to reposition, how to reimagine the history of the book, not as the history of printing, but as the history of reading, the history of consumption, the history of circulation, and so forth and so on. So, uh, in my book, I apply this uh, approach uh, very uh, methodically, I would say, and I contrast it to the Frenchness part, to the Armenianness part, which is that, of course, the history of printing has been done numerous times, as I mentioned, and the way it's been done for the most part in Yerevan and other places is to focus on colophones at the end of books and focus on particular types of documents, mostly colophonic materials and secondary sources. My interest in writing this book is to go back to the archives and look at notarial records, look at inventories of uh, libraries used by private merchants so that I can have an access, a sneak preview into their heads so as to know what kind of ideas they were kicking around in their, in their heads as they walked or boarded ships to travel. So the book makes three general uh, interventions into this larger field, both in terms of book history and world history, I have to say, and Khachig formulated that brilliantly, I have to say, I forget the exact formulation, but the formulation between world history, global history, and well, Armenian history was nicely put in the sense that one only enriches the other. So, with that in mind, I'll give you a very quick summary overview now of the contents, the main contributions I make, and these are in uh, sequential order. I make a contribution, I argue, about using the history of the book itself as an optic, as a lens through which to study the formation of the early modern Armenian diaspora. Now, you might be asking yourself, what is early modern? Didn't we have a diaspora already? Why, why is Aslanian going back so far? The reasons I'm doing this is because for most Armenians and most others, I would say, when people mention the word Armenian diaspora, the first thing that comes to their minds is, of course, the genocide and the 20th century diaspora that was born from this very melancholic, criminal, sad, moment in Armenian history. But I'm here to say that Armenians have had a diaspora before the modern diaspora of the 20th century. In fact, one of the most vibrant periods of their history, of their entire history, was the period that I focus on, which is the early modern period from 1500 to 1800, give or take a decade or two. And depending on one's uh, point of view and so on, uh, of course, in the Armenian case, 1500 to 1800, which is what the world, world historians take to be the early modern period in global history, becomes 1600 or 16, 1597 to 1800. 
So the early modernity arrives about, about 100 years late for the Armenians, and there are reasons that are uh, quite sensible for, for, that, for that occurrence, for that shift. So the first argument I make in the book is that to understand the early modern Armenian diaspora, you need to understand two what I call twin detonations of forced mobility, and that forced Armenians out of their ancestral lands in the early part of the 1600s and drove them to safer locations. Many of them, there are two kinds of deportations that I'll talk about in a second, but together they conspired to create both Eastern and Western Armenian diasporas in the early modern period. That came to, uh, after, they were, after this diaspora was birthed, the Western Armenian and the Eastern Armenian components of this diaspora uh, met each other in port cities of the world of the world of the world's burgeoning global economy of that period. So the first com the first contribution is that I'll talk about that in a bit of in a bit more detail in a short while. The second contribution related to that is the shift from scribal production to mechanical reproduction. And by scribal production, of course, I mean the act of laboriously and meticulously creating manuscripts by hand. And so that shift, which is at the core of the printing revolution, took place in the Armenian context in the early 1500s, but it actually took off in the late 1600s. So the question I have in my book, one of the questions I have is, why? Why did the Armenians shift from, mechanical, from uh, manual production of manuscript culture to mechanical reproduction? What were the reasons for this? Are there, are there any causal factors involved here that may have escaped other people people's attention in the past. And I argue, yes, there are, there are some causal factors, and yes, they have escaped other people's attention. And my book largely deals with addressing what has escaped this kind of general scholarly uh, attention. The third contribution I make to my, in my book, the one that I think is the most interesting one, but the one I will talk about the least here, given that I have time constraints and I've already discussed this in other venues, is the argument as to why the Armenians uh, uh, after they shifted their focus from scribal to mechanical and started printing in uh, various port city locations in the Armenian diaspora, the question is why did they keep up printing with such vigor? What was the driving engine of book history is, the, is one of the questions I ask in my book. And the answer I give to it, the shorthand answer, is that they were driven to it, to publishing more and more books through mechanical reproduction, mostly because they were pressured by threats coming from Europe, from the Roman Catholic Church in particular, uh, converting Armenians in, in the Ottoman Empire as well as Iran, uh, a kind of face-to-face -face between, uh, face-off between the Roman Catholic Church and the Armenian Church on the confessional tenets of each church. And this struggle that in, ensued between the Armenians and the Church of Rome is what historians in the last 20 years or so have been calling in the context of European history and global history nowadays as confessionalism, which is basically the tightening of boundaries between the Armenian church and sister or brother churches within the larger fold of Christianity. And these other churches are known as confessions. And so one of the arguments I make in the book is that historians thus far have misconstrued Armenian uh, identity to a large extent by referring to the Armenians as an ethno-religious community. I argue in my book that Armenians are not an ethno-religious community. Maybe they have never been ethno-religious community. They are, properly speaking, an ethno-confessional community. That is to say, they are defined by the tenets and the uh, doctrines of their church, not by religion as such. They are Christians, of course, but their main beef, to put it in a very colloquial manner, is not with other religions. Their main issue has always been with other kinds of Christian Confessions. In this case, the Roman Catholic Church in Chalcedon is absolutely at the forefront of this struggle. And this is, in a nutshell, why they produced so many books. So in, with that said, let me quickly move to uh, uh, talking about the uh, early modern, the origins of the early modern Armenian diaspora. So the early modern period for the Armenians, as I suggested very briefly earlier, is one that can be pinpointed with some accuracy in terms of when it actually began and when it ended. And in terms of its origin dates, uh, one can say with quite confidence that if there were to be a birth certificate for the, uh, for the early modern period for the Armenians, it would have to be 
issued sometime between 1597 and 1607. This is a pretty narrow window in global history. It's rare to, to find a birth of something uh, momentous in such a short period of time. And I can say with confidence that this is an important period, the 10 year period that I mentioned, simply because during that period, the first of twin of two detonations of forced mobility drove Armenians from their, from their ancestral lands. And this, the first detonation is one that has hardly been commented on by Armenian scholars. A few have written, there's at least one or two scholars who have written, one book has been written for sure, and a few articles at the most. So the first one, the first of these detonations is what I call uh, using, following uh, his Ottoman historiography, what's called, uh, I follow uh, what's called the Biyuk uh, Kachgun, which basically means in Ottoman Turkish, the great flight, Kachgun. And this happened largely in the, the 1597 to 1607 period because at this time, the Ottoman Empire, which was once very formidable in the world, began to experience a great crisis from which it barely came out uh, successfully. And the first crisis it, fa it faced during this time is known as the Jalali uprisings. These are basically uprisings of uh, army officers and bandits and so on that ran uh, amok in the eastern frontiers of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, they weren't paid enough because of the silver cur because of the de devaluation of the silver currency in the Ottoman Empire, largely connected to the discovery of New World silver in the New World in Bolivia. So it's a global. It takes a global lens to understand uh, this small period, this small space and period in world history known as Eastern Anatolia, Western Armenia, 1597 to 17 to 1607. So to understand this, you need to take into account silver that was flowing across the world, pumped into the world economy from New World silver that was discovered in Potosi, which led to uh, incredible uh, periods of inflation across the world. A number of empires collapsed because of this or lost their standing. And one of these was almost the Ottoman Empire. They, it couldn't pay its own forces, its own army with its silver currency, the Akche. It had because it had been devaluated by so much. And so in this period, uprisings occurred in the eastern frontier of the Ottoman Empire. Uh, and rebels known as Jalalis or Jalalis came to power. They, they wreaked havoc with the, uh, the landscape of eastern Anatolia, western Armenia. And as a result of their depredations and, and so forth, what happened was a flight of about 40 to 60,000 people from the eastern frontiers, many of them Armenians, probably around 40,000 Armenians, although figures are difficult to, uh, to come by, left their homes uh, in the east and fled to safer locations in the west. They went to Istanbul, they went to Constantinople, they went to Smyrna, uh, Izmir, they went to, especially to a place called uh, Rodosto or Tekirdağ. These are the places which witness the origins of a Western Armenian diaspora. What we call today as Western Armenian, I myself count as one, a proud member of that diaspora, was brought to fruition in these years that I'm re referring to here, in the 1590s or so, early 1600s, where Armenians settled in large numbers in Constantinople and other places where their numbers had been very, very, uh, very low or very few before the Jalalis. So that was the first uh, explosion that drove Armenians out. The second explosion happened in near simultaneity to the first, and it happened in a way that was causally connected to the first as well, and is, is a, a deportation or a, a kind of forced migration of Armenians that is much better studied by historians. And it's the migration, forced migration, that historians, again, Ottoman and uh, Soviet historians, refer to as another kind of buyuk, with another buyuk uh, classification. And that is the Biyuk Sürgün, or the great, uh, uh, the great deportations. And this happened when Shah Abbas I, the most formidable emperor or uh, ruler of Soviet Iran, um, moved his forces into Ottoman territory in a bid to reclaim territories lost by his predecessors to Ottoman rulers in wars that the Ottomans had fought with the Safavids for 100 years, and each round of warfare, the Ottomans kept on winning, the Soviets kept on losing more, more ground, and so Ab Abbas I thought it was very pro uh, uh, propitious at that moment to invade the Ottoman Empire and hit them when they were the, at their weakest. And he did so, but when Ottoman forces advanced on the, front, on this, on the Shah's forces in the summer of 1603 or thereabouts, uh, 
the Shah decided to practice an old, an old school technique of warfare, which is called scorched earth policy. Basically, he raised the entire re region to the ground, not leaving even a blade of grass to the advancing Ottoman forces uh, to feed off or to, to, to gain some kind of sustenance. So in the process of practicing scorched earth policy, the Shah also forcibly up, uprooted, displaced approximately 300,000 Armenians and others, and drove them into the depths of Iran to resettle them into various parts of his domains. Many of them died of typhoid and other diseases, pestilential disease, diseases, as they were cultivating in the silk producing areas of the, south, uh, Cas of the uh, southern shores of the Caspian Sea in Iran. But the Shah, of course, as we should know, or as we know by now, was quite gentle when it came to a select small elite group of Armenians. And these Armenians were silk traders who had made a name for themselves and were working in the town known as Jufa, at the time later on to be called Old Jufa. The Shah took these Armenians, about 10,000 or so people, treated them with relative kid gloves, and transported them to Isfahan, where he gave them a land on the other side of the river, Zayande, where the Armenians soon began to uh, attract the attention of the Safavid dynasty and act as the dynasty's private merchants. And this allowed them to catapult themselves into international global traders of silk and other luxury commodities. And their descendants, uh, uh, the descendants of the Jufa merchants went on to populate the port cities of the world. They established diasporic nodes in the Indian Ocean, in the Mediterranean, in the Atlantic. And there, they also met up with the descendants of survivors of the Buyuk Kachgun, who also, using ports like Constantinople, Smyrna, and other places, also had settled down in port cities. So in these port city locations, the two wings of the great Armenian diaspora, the Western and the Eastern, came to uh, coalesce side by side, came to work together, and so on. And there, as they were being form formed as a diaspora, the, the regions that they had uh, abandoned behind them out of force, uh, namely the Armenian highland where the scriptoria were located, were largely uh, destroyed or suffered depredations from a century of warfare between Iran and, and uh, the Ottoman Empire. And this warfare culminating in the Buyuk Kachkun period basically le uh, uh, led to a precipitous decline in scribal production in the, all the scriptoria of the, of the plateau where the Armenians worked. And this, of course, came at a time when the Armenian church itself was putting up a life and death struggle against confessionalizing missionaries coming from Rome, trying to convert Armenian Christians because it was easier to convert Christians than, of course, Muslims. And so in this case, uh, the two things happen to coincide almost beautifully, perfectly, in one larger context, which is to say that uh, Armenians formed a global diaspora. Most of the nodes of the global diaspora of Western and Eastern Armenians were port cities. That's a fact. It's undebatable. The majority of these centers were port cities. And at the same time, as they were forming these port city locations and as uh, hubs for a diasporic uh, global network, the, the very places of manuscript production in the East were actually destroyed or crippled. And this led, uh, the, this led to a spike in the price of manuscripts. This led to the absence or dearth or famine, as some people have referred to it, of Armenian manuscripts. And the manuscripts that were affected the most, it seems, were religious manuscripts or manuscripts that were needed for the confessional teachings of the Armenian church, right at the time when the Roman church was making inroads into the Armenians. So, uh, with that said, uh, I will, I will then, uh, I'll, I'll say a few words now about port cities and printers and why, the question of course is why printing centers were in port cities. And, uh, but before I say that, let me, let me give you a couple of factoids which Khachi also uh, presaged uh, me doing so by already telling you that a thousand titles were printed more or less, a thousand book titles in Armenian in this whole period, 1512 to 1800. Out of the 1,000 titles, if we give a conservative estimate of 400 to 500 print runs, we come up with a total sum of approximately half a million to 750,000 individual books printed by Armenians in this entire period. Now, this may look like chump change to you, 
especially when you compare it to 250 million books printed in Europe during approximately the same time. But of course, Armenians are a very small nation, as I always say. So uh, the numbers actually look impressive given the size of the Armenian reading population itself. So out of all these places, uh, the 21 places or 19 places in my book, I have the map, I have the uh, visual for 19, but there were 21 places where printing centers were established and owned by Armenians. So out of the, fifth, out of the 21 or 19 centers, a clear 78.84% of all the uh, Armenian printing locations were in port cities. So uh, there have been people who have been uh, trying to question the very legitimacy of a port Armenian and port city uh, thesis for some time, but all I can tell them is look at the facts themselves. If you look at port cities, whether it's riverine port cities, fluvial port cities, or maritime port cities, it makes little difference because transportation is key here. Uh, if you look at the facts, you will see that the overwhelming majority happen to be in port cities. So is there a reason for this, or is this a quirk of history? Is this an accident, one may ask? And of course, the historian always looks beyond accidents. The historian wants to understand why certain things happen in certain places. And of course, in trying to grapple with this, I came up with a theory that there, it's not a coincidence. It's actually part of a larger uh, uh, relationship that's causal almost that I've summed up with the easy title of PPP. I call it the PPP factor, Port City, Port Armenian and Printer. They always come together, it seems. And the re why do they come together, one may ask. Well, the reasons are threefold, at least, that I address in the book. First reason, majority of the Armenian diasporic centers in the early modern period were in port cities. That's, that's not arguable. The majority, overwhelming majority, were in port cities. Madras, Calcutta, Surat, uh, Bombay uh, in the east. And then if you move to the, to, to the west, in Europe, you have Amsterdam, you have uh, Venice, you have London, you have... Uh, Marseille, you have a few other places as well. So overwhelmingly, it's a port city network. So why, why, do they, uh, why are printers attracted to port cities? Because first and foremost, port cities come with port Armenians. Port Armenians are already settled in port cities. They have their diasporic network. They have their infrastructure in place. And if a printer wants to print a book, and printers for this, in this period are almost exclusively members of the higher echelon of the Armenian church, their vartabids, or people who have the literacy and other skills that it would take for someone to set up a printing shop. So most of them are attracted to port cities because that's where Port Armenians reside. They have infrastructure already in place for them. They are also attracted to port cities because port, in order to become a printer in this period, you need to have a vast apparatus, to use Naples' term, but more than anything else, in all the component parts of vast apparatus, you need to have people who are punch cutters, letter cutters, people who can make matrices, people who can create lead type, and so forth. All these specialists, for the most part in the early modern period, live either in or near port cities. And I'll give you an example of that in the next slide. Uh, more impor most importantly, perhaps, port cities came with infrastructure of transportation second to none, the cheapest way of transporting commodities any time in world history. The cheapest way has always been by water. Shipping by water, because you don't take, you don't pay uh, customs fees and taxes at every two steps that you take, assuming you have cannon on your ships, which uh, in this period was common. So maritime transportation made the decisive difference in terms of port city location. So, with all this said, you might wonder, well, how how do how do I make how do, how can I explain this based on data and evidence? Well, I can explain this to you with one case study that I've chosen especially for this, for the last couple of lectures I've given on my book, which is a case study of the most important center for Armenian printing in the entire early modern period, which is Amsterdam. Amsterdam was the mecca of Armenian printing. Amsterdam, between 1660 or 57, when the first Armenian printer arrived in the city, and 1717, when the last printer left, uh, Amsterdam produced four consecutive Armenian printing center, printing establishments, four. Amsterdam had two separate Armenian churches, luckily not at the same time. And you may wonder to yourself, how did these Armenians in Amsterdam do it, right? How, were they like in the thousands? Were they in the tens of thousands of people that they had four printing presses that they produced 60,000 books in this 50-year period, some of the best books 
Armenians have ever printed. And the answer, of course, to, to the question of how many Armenians lived in Amsterdam is 40, 40, okay, 40. 40 Armenians produced four consecutive printing presses and two churches. Like I said, luckily not at the same time, although I would not have been surprised that there were two Armenian churches at the same time in a community of 40, because that, ha that has happened before. So uh, why do I focus on Amsterdam? Well, I focus on Amsterdam in addition to, as a, as a case study to flesh out my, our larger arguments, because Amsterdam also happens to be a place where the printing revolution for the Armenians was established by people who came from the neck of the woods in the world that has been, unfortunately, too many times in the news over the last three years. And of course, I'm referring to here, I'm referring here to uh, Artsakh, Nagorno-Karabakh, whatever one wants to call it, and Nakhichevan. These are two areas where the Amsterdam press has very close, intimate ties. How so, you might ask? Well, the founder of the Amsterdam press is a little known and underappreciated Armenian printer, a, a deacon, a, a priest in the Armenian church, by the name of Mateos Tsaretsi. Mateos Tsaretsi is from a village called Tsar. And Tsar happens to be in the region right outside of Kelbajar, today's war torn region, which, has, which used to have a small village with a church and so on. You, the church tombstones are now on, on, the, on the facade of an Azerbaijani school. Tsar itself is known as Tsar. And no trace of the Armenians is left there, as far as I know, except for a few dilapidated and broken tombstones. But Mateus Tsaretsi was from Tsar, from Kalbajar. He moved to, Ar to Amsterdam uh, via a circuitous uh, fashion, but in 1657, in 16, sorry, 1657, Mateus uh, was the first Armenian to go to Europe with the intent of printing the Armenian Bible. This was the lifelong dream of the Armenian church. The man arrives in Italy, the place where all, all Armenians go to to print books. And he spends a few years in Italy, tries to find a punch cutter and so on. Everywhere he goes, he hits a wall. He just, at some point, he's like a remarkably smart, uh, clever Armenian. At some point, he asks, he, after hitting the 10th obstacle, he asks himself, what is, what, is, what is the problem that I'm not succeeding in this place? And so a little light bulb flashes in his head, and he's, he asks himself whether he's actually in the right country or the wrong country, and it turns out he's in the wrong country because Rome, the Italian peninsula, is very much a papal area, and Roman censorship against the Armenians wouldn't allow the publication of a Bible. So Mateos did what others had done before him, which is to say what the Sephardic Jews had done before him. They were also printing in Italy at that time. In 1757, Mateos takes off for Amsterdam in the north, a Dutch colony, Protestant, very little censorship, excellent uh, uh, infrastructure for printers, uh, letter cutters, and so on, and first-rate transportation routes. So he goes to Amsterdam, he meets a port Armenian in 1557, who then puts him in touch with the leading punch cutter of his age, of all punch cutters, a man by the name of Christopher Van Dyck, or Van Dyck, who then designs Armenian fonts for him, and Mateus begins to print a book. His first book, Jesus the Son, is not even appeared from the press in 1660 when creditors appear before him to claim their money. And at that moment, among the people who had appeared at his deathbed is another port Armenian by the name of uh, Avedis Gligensi, who's the brother of Voskan Yerevansi, who's one of my cultural heroes. He's an Armenian uh, in the Church of Armenia, very high up, uh, Vartabed, and he's been sent to Europe to print the Bible as well. Uh, Voskan Yerevansi's brother, Avedis Gligensi, was a port Armenian par excellence. He appears before Mateos, offers to buy the press for him in exchange for a donation that he gives to the uh, Armenian church of Echmeazin, and uh, uh, it's basically called the Surp Sarkis Zoravar and Surp Echmeazin Press. So the second printer who arrives in Amsterdam, Voskan Yerevansi, is actually from Jufa originally, despite his moniker. He succeeds in printing the first Armenian Bible. You can see if, uh, a photo of it here at, at the bottom right corner. That's the first Armenian Bible. And then Voskan leaves with his press to Livorno and then moves to Marseille, another port city, where he continues his production. Uh, the last Armenian printers in Amsterdam are Mateos Hovannesian and Thomas Varandetsi Hovannesian, who arrive in Amsterdam 1685 and 1695, respectively. 
Thomas Vanandeti is from a village in Nakhichevan known as Vanand, as the name implies, and from a region, a canton known as Gohtan, Gohtan. So he arrives in Amsterdam and he starts, the, he opens the last printing press in Amsterdam that's Armenian, and one of the first books he prints is Mofses Khorinazi's History of the Armenians, one of the most important works in Armenian literature, uh, a scholarship over the last thousand plus years. And you can see here in 1695 edition of this book, which was revolutionary in the impact it had on the Armenian diaspora of readers. So I will, I'll just, I'll, I'll say a few, I'll conclude now because I know we're running out of time. So I'll just say a few things I, I haven't really, uh, I've touched upon this earlier on confessionalization. I won't belabor this point or bore you too much, but I will tell you this much. Confessionalization is really the main driving engine for Armenian book history. Why is this the case? I alluded to this before. The Armenian church was in a struggle with the Catholic church. Uh, this struggle was known, is known as confessionalism, too long of a history to get, it, to get into, but essentially the Armenian church, unlike the Roman church, of course, has different doctrines and different, the liturgy is different, the rites are different, the, the uh, entire basis of the confessional underpinnings of the Armenian church is different from the Roman church. What are these major differences, you might say? Well, first and foremost, uh, the Armenian church, of course, rejects, categorically denies and rejects the Council of Chalcedon on the question of the nature of Christ. Did Christ have two natures in one, or did he have just one nature? Uh, in other words, how many angels can dance on the head of a pin, you might ask, from a 21st century position, point of, point of view. But these questions were very, very important in this earlier period, and of course, uh, the Armenian church not only did disagreed with Chalcedon, but it also had a different view of where the Holy Spirit proceeded from, right? You might say, well, this controversy was, uh, controversy was actually very, very, uh, a burning controversy at the time. It's known as filioque, or filioque, which is, and the whole, the, basically the view that the Catholic Church held, which is that the Holy Spirit proceeds from the Father and the Son, filioque. The Armenian Church categorically, adamantly, violently denied the existence of filioque. The last, uh, perhaps, difference is whether you mix wine, whether you mix water with wine when you give communion. Catholics always mix water with wine. The Armenian Church, because of their party and the Iranian background, never mix water with wine. Of course, people killed each other over this, and people built entire collective identities as nations on the basis of confessional loyalties. And this is another uh, emphasis that I place on the book. So I will, I will end by just showing you very quickly uh, some of the data that I produced. One of the data, one of the on all school uh, strong points is that it relies on quantitative data, data crunching, to come up with larger patterns of history. And so when you map out a thousand books, and I was lucky to have a graduate student to help me do this, and you look at the statistical configuration that arrives, that you arrive at on the basis of the contents of the books and the titles and so on, you get a general picture of what they were printing and why they were printing. And one, 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 one sees overall is that from 1590, from 1512 to 1800, 300 year period, you have 70% of the books that were printed in Armenian are religious books, religious and confessional. If you zoom in and you look at decade by decade, which the Arnold School allows you to do with its quantitative approach, you find out that the periods that have the highest uh, number, the highest percentage of books that are confessional or religious are the exact periods when the Catholics and the Armenians are at each other's throats in Istanbul, Constantinople, and other places, including in Nijul, including in Nijufa. So in the 1710 periods, the number of books goes up to uh, 1,700, 78%, 1,710s, 80%. In the 1740s, the number of religious and ca uh, confessional books, including catechisms and so on, spike at an all-time high of 84%. 84 out of 100 books printed were on for the church, by the church, for the church, for the church leadership, for the, as, a, as a means, as a lever of uh, holding back Rome in its confessional uh, intrusions into the Armenian world. And I will, I'm going to end here. If you have any questions, I'll be happy to answer them. Thank you.